time of filming this video in 2020, Boeing is rolling out the first updated F-18 Super Hornet Rhino in the context of a service life extension program that is going to improve the useful life of the aircraft up to 9,000 hours. But what matters the most, these aircraft will also be upgraded to the Block 3 variant, with an outstanding array of improvements that are going to keep the plane at the leading edge of technology and effectiveness. All of this despite the fact that the original idea is about 50 years old and the plane came into being only thanks to utter industrial failures. Three. What? Well, I think it was three failures, not two. What? What do you mean with three? In the history of the F-18, there were actually three key failures that made the plane into what it is today. Well, all right, if you think you know better, then please be my guest. Hey everyone, my name is Jenny Ma, and I also run an aviation channel here on YouTube where I break down the engineering and the history behind a lot of different airplanes. But today I'm here to tell you a little story about the history of the F-A-18 Hornet. In the late 60s, a group of Air Force officers became known as the Fighter Mafia. And no, this wasn't a Godfather Fight Club mashup. Instead, they advocated for a new lightweight fighter aircraft for the Air Force that would be dedicated to air-to-air -air missions. So this eventually led to the establishment of the Lightweight Fighter Program. Now, the history of the Lightweight Fighter Program would require a long video in and of itself, but what matters in this context is that in 1974, the program reached the stage of a flyaway competition between the two main contenders, the YF-16 built by General Dynamics and the YF-17 Cobra by Northrop. And eventually, the US Air Force selected the YF-16 as the winner of this competition, and it would go on to become a modern staple for the US Air Force, also known as the F-16 Viper. But it wasn't the end for the YF-17 either, because by the early 70s, the Navy was also looking for a new aircraft to replace its existing fleet of attack and fighter aircrafts, including the A-4, the A-7, and the F-4. They were in search of a new multi-role aircraft. However, with a tight defense budget, Congress mandated the Navy to abandon its plan for a new aircraft and instead look at pre-existing designs. So they experimented with a simplified version of the F-14 Tomcat and a naval version of the F-15 Eagle, but both turned out to be almost as expensive as the original jets. So the Navy turned their attention to the lightweight fighter program once again. Now they actually weren't huge fans of the F-16, the winner picked by the US Air Force, because they deemed it too structurally fragile to be converted into carrier operations. But they did see potential in the YF-17, especially from the reliability of its twin engines. So the Navy proceeded to redesign the YF-17 extensively, giving birth to the F-18 Hornets. So first, the failure of the YF-17 sowed the seed for the eventual F-18. But a few decades later, in the 80s, another failure would shape the history of the F-A-18s going forward. In 1983, the Navy was in search of another replacement aircraft, and this time it was for the A-6 Intruder Bomber. Now, this new aircraft was expected to be a technological marvel, making use of composite materials and integrated radar antenna. But more importantly, it was going to be the very first application of stealth technology to a carrier-based plane. A team composed of McDonnell Douglas and General Dynamics was awarded the contract, and this new plane was named the A-12 Avenger. However, since stealth and composites were still relatively new technologies at that time, the engineers encountered problem after problem, and eventually the weight of the aircraft ballooned and the cost spiraled out of control. So in 1990, the US government decided to pull the plug. And at that point, the Navy had to find a solution fast. So the answer was a heavily modified F-18 Hornet, also called the Super Hornet. So secondly, the failure of the A-12 Avenger directly contributed to the growth of the F-18 program. But wait, the Navy still wasn't done replacing jets. It still had one more to go, and that was the F-14 Tomcat. Now the F-14 has always been a very large and complex jet with high maintenance and a focus for air-to-air -air combat missions. So the Navy was looking for a smaller and simpler replacement jet. So in 1988, the Navy started to consider a navalized version of the jet that would eventually become the F-22 Raptor. Now they were drawn to its power and stealth, but it wasn't meant for carrier operations. And as it turned out, a navalized version of the F-22 would have required a weight penalty of 10 to 15%. Now this would have reduced performance, but also required a redesigned wing. Now this is similar to what happened to the navalized version of the F-35. 
So it was decided that this trade-off was not a very good one, and this attempt at adding a new aircraft to the inventory ended with a failure. But would the disintegration of the Soviet Union in 1991, the original threat that the F-14s were designed to meet, actually disappeared, so this further added a question mark to their permanence on these flight decks. So the Navy was left with just one option, and that was to ask the F-18 to do, well, everything. So these three failures eventually pushed the Navy to focus on a truly multi-role platform, and that would eventually become the F-18 Hornet and the Super Hornet. Thanks for letting me stop by, I guess. Thanks, Jenny. I guess I was giving the Y F-17 for granted. So go and check out Jenny's channel and her video on the F-18 after watching this. The F-18 EF Super Hornet is a real multi-role platform and I insist on the term platform. Marrying the same conceptualization as the United States Air Force, the Navy is focusing on the weapons carried and the network-centric integration of the plane as a node of the communications network. The actual design and performance of the plane seem at this stage to matter less than they used to even just 20 years ago. They're not irrelevant, obviously, but less important. I believe that this approach has some risks, but this is a subject for another day. What matters is that we need to keep this approach in mind while we analyze the plane. The first element to consider is the Service Life Improvement Program. So every structure, metal or composite, suffers from fatigue. Fatigue is a name given to the proliferation of micro cracks within the structure when it is exposed to loads close but inferior to the breaking point. Over time, these breaks proliferate to the point where a structural element may break even if the load is not above the breaking point. A service life improvement program is, first and foremost, the replacement of the structural components that are known to be subject to fatigue. For a naval plane like the F-18, corrosion could also be an important factor too. From this point of view, the F-18 airframe has been designed with the life extension in mind. The Rhino has a relatively limited number of structural parts, if compared to older planes, and this has several advantages. Well, there is less stuff to replace, so the operation is quicker. Also, fewer seams and junctions mean an increased general robustness with the weight being equal, which is also very helpful for a carrier-based plane. This is actually easy to understand. Junctions tend to be weaker than solid material because discontinuity concentrates stress. If you want to know more about this, please let me know in the comments below. It is a subject worth a video in itself. Fewer junctions also mean fewer areas subject to fatigue. One classical area subject to fatigue, in fact, is the material around a rivet hole. Fewer joints mean fewer weak areas. So it's no surprise that the plain useful life can be extended by 50% with such a replacement program. The new Block 3 planes will be equipped with conformal fuel tanks above the inner section of the wing. The F-15 have them for ages and now they are becoming quite common, for example on the F-16 or on the Rafale. On the F-18 they have been available for a while, albeit they have been rarely used. Now they will be standard equipment on the Block 3, holding 515 gallons on each wing, a total of 3,170 kilos of fuel, roughly corresponding to a 50% increase over the internal fuel. The purpose of the two conformal tanks is to replace the wing-mounted 480 gallons tanks, freeing up to hard points and reducing the drag if compared with the classic configuration. In some sources, it is said that the addition of the two conformal tanks reduced the plane drag, implying that we are talking the clean configuration drag, but this seems difficult to be true, actually. It is almost sure that the wave drag at transonic and supersonic speed is going to increase. But please notice that this fits well with the concept of platform we were discussing before. To free up two additional hard points for the weapons, 
some penalization on the pure performance of the plane has been accepted. In practice, this won't have any particular detrimental effect because the plane is never clean, but still, it is indicative of the line of thinking. In any case, the tank mounted on the center line of the plane with 330 gallons is not going to go away. Not only to add the extra fuel, but also for a very bizarre feature. The infrared search and track today is an essential sensor for many combat planes. It uses the same technology as a forward-looking infrared and it can be used as such, but the infrared search and track main output is a track on a screen, not an image. It complements the radar or the information received from a data link, concurring to form a complete tactical picture presented in a unified representation to the pilot. All of this if the plane is obviously capable of data fusion, which is the case. The United States has pioneered infrared search and track with very crude units mounted on the classical interceptors of the Century series. But since radar performance is kept improving and at the time sensor fusion was not possible, it was abandoned, only to be picked up by the Soviets in the 80s, who in turn pioneered its integration into the plane combat and fire control system. The European designs of the 90s all rely quite heavily on the infrared search and track that is considered a very important passive sensor. It is now returning on American planes and the F-18 is no exception, save for the fact that the infrared search and track is placed on the nose of the centerline fuel tank. And this is quite a bizarre solution, and it implies that the fuel tank will be permanently mounted on the plane. This will probably happen anyway because it is a standard configuration for the F-18, but it won't be possible to jettison the tank lightly in air combat, because the cost of each tank will be in the millions. The Lockheed Martin A and ASG-34 infrared search and track works in the far infrared and it is the same unit mounted on the United States Air Force Legion pod, which does not contain fuel. The Legion pod has the particular feature to provide pod-to-pod -pod communication, thus providing to the carrying plane a picture derived from more than one infrared search and track, if available. Why is this important? Because infrared search and track cannot natively provide a distance from a target, but using two, looking at the same target and knowing the earth position, it is possible to triangulate the target position. Uh, to be fair, this is not the only way to extract the distance information from an earth, but it is surely a very effective way. A Navy pilot who tested the feature said it is eye-watering, I'll let you interpret that. The F-18 Block 3 Erst centerline tank doesn't have the same feature, but since the F-18 is designed to be a node in a network, the information is exchanged directly among planes, and this takes us to the next point. The F-18 Block 3 has an ACS to allow the pilot to easily process the information from the DTPN, which is an OEMS compliant, and uses the new TTNT. Since I believe this point is obvious, thank you very much for watching and... Okay, 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 it's just a joke, just a joke, relax. So the ACS is the Advanced Cockpit System. It is basically the usual large touchscreen that replaces almost everything else in the cockpit. At this point in time, it's becoming pretty common, so there's not much to say about it. The TTNT is the new super secure and super reliable data link connecting the planes, or better, it is the standard used to implement the data link among different planes. The important bit is that it has quite a large bandwidth, which is needed to support the OMS standard. More on this later. DTPN stands for Distributed Targeting Processor Network. It is basically a piece of the fire control architecture that is responsible for integrating the information that comes to the plane sensors and the TTNT into a coherent picture usable by the pilot. Again, today many modern planes are capable of this kind of integration. 
Some F-35 fans think that only the F-35 has it. Sorry guys, it's not the case. The OMS standard is a US government owned architectural specification. It defines the messaging protocols and formats between the different computers on the different pieces of hardware. In the past, monetary network standards used to define the hardware and the electrical specifications of the network. For example, the ubiquitous MIL STD1553 defines how cables and connectors must be built together with voltages, waveforms of signals and other electrical specification. The 1553 is like the Ethernet standard in commercial networks to make a comparison. However, to make two computers communicate, developers had to establish a protocol. They had to make decisions like, if I send you a command string like 100100, you, missile computer, start cooling the sensor. If I receive 110101, it is you, missile computer, telling me that the sensor is cool. No use to say this is a remarkably complex job that takes a lot of time and resources and it needs to be repeated over and over for each of the weapons you want to integrate with the plane. This is the reason why integrating a weapon in a plane costs so much. The OEMS standard simplifies the job, defining the communication to a higher level. For example, the OEMS has standard ways of defining a target track, a video, a video stream, or text messages exchanged among platforms. To make a comparison, it is like working directly with files and folders without caring too much about the hardware behind. However, it is rather intuitive that the integration job is simplified and complex information exchanges, like the one that allows to present a unified tactical situation on the ACS from different sensors, well, they become possible. If you like this video, I'm sure you will love the videos that are going to appear beside me. In the meanwhile, please like, dislike, subscribe and hit the bell so you won't miss anything. And if you could consider supporting the channel on Subscribestar or Patreon, that would be amazing and you will have my gratitude forever. In the meanwhile, thank you very, very, very much for watching. See you in the next video.